for having me. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, two related topics, forecasting and aligning AI. Uh, so just for context, I guess uh, my kind of overall research goal is the following. So um, I think it's relatively likely that AI is at some point going to have a transformative effect on society. And I want to kind of you know, do the research that will help us make that go well. And so uh, my research kind of splits into three categories related to this. Uh, one is alignment, or ensuring that uh, AI systems act reliably in humanity's interests. Um, another is empowerment, so helping humans make better decisions. And the third is forecasting, understanding and predicting uh, what will happen as we continue to make, continue to make advances in ML. And so today, I guess I'm not really going to talk so much about the second one, but I'll talk about uh, the first and third topics. So uh, in this talk, I guess, first I'll talk about kind of uh, ways of testing, uh, I guess, uh, ideas around alignment uh, with various uh, carefully designed experiments. Uh, so one is going to try to understand a phenomenon called reward hacking. And uh, the other, the sort of next part of the talk will be on understanding uh, the idea of truthfulness in language models. Um, and then the last part of the talk will be on forecasting future ML progress and properties. And I should say uh, most of this, well, pretty much all of this work was not really done uh, by me, but by uh, my great group of students who are uh, shown here. So uh, let's kind of jump in. And also feel free to interrupt with questions at any point. So uh, first, I want to talk about reward hacking. Uh, so what is reward hacking? So I guess there's this kind of folklore uh, belief or, or kind of understanding that in reinforcement learning, powerful RL optimizers tend to overfit and find ways to hack their reward functions. And uh, so this is ki there's kind of a lot of anecdotal evidence for this or ways of showing it in, in simple environments like grid world environments. Uh, but we wanted to really understand this more systematically. So we, you know, we there's kind of complex settings where there's anecdotes. There's simple settings where there's kind of more systematic experiments. We wanted to come up with systematic measurement in richer environments where we could do things like vary the model size, vary the number of training steps, things like that. Why do we want to vary these things? Well, basically, if the kind of idea is that uh, you know it's somehow about like the, how powerful the optimizer is, we want some way of operationalizing what it means to be a powerful optimizer. And so you know, ways of doing that would be saying your policy model has a lot of parameters, or you train for a really long time. Uh, or things like that. And so we want to see if those things really do affect uh, reward hacking and, and whether we can observe it consistently. So I guess just to give an idea of what I mean by reward hacking, here's one environment that we considered. Uh, so this is a traffic simulation where you have cars merging onto a highway. right? So they're kind of merging here. There's some cars already on the highway. And um, the RL model controls some subset of the cars. Imagine that they're like self-driving cars or something like that. And they're trying to control those cars to help maximize the overall uh, throughput of this uh, traffic simulation. So getting you know, kind of as much uh, traffic through the highway as possible. And so the reward function here, uh, I guess in some sense, the true reward might be something like uh, you want kind of you know, the average person to have the smallest commute time possible. Or maybe you think that like, it's bad if, a, if some people have like, a super long commute. So maybe it's not like the average commute, but something that also pays attention to the tails. Uh, but for now, let's just imagine it's like the average commute is kind of the true reward we care about. So reward hacking is when the thing that we optimize is a bit different from the true reward. And the RL policy exploits that. In this case, the thing that was actually optimized, or the proxy reward, was to maximize the mean velocity. Um, we chose this actually because it was the default uh, in the simulation. So this was actually what like practitioners kind of came up with as what they thought they wanted. But you can see that there's actually kind of a problem here, because I can maximize the mean velocity if I let like some cars go super, super fast, even if the other cars are stuck. And so uh, the RL policy ends up exploiting this. I guess it exploits this and a uh, fact about the simulation. So what it does is, I guess, initially, if you start with a small model, it kind of 
you get normal behavior, um, where it just kind of figures out how to like gracefully merge. But for larger models, what happens is it figures out that it can use the cars it controls to block any new cars from ever merging onto the highway uh, by just blocking the on-ramp. And uh, the on-ramp only has finite length in the simulation, so cars like can only spawn as far back as the beginning of the on-ramp. So it doesn't model that there's then like more and more cars piling up behind. So there's some finite number of cars on this on-ramp that are stuck, but then there's lots of cars on the highway that are going at kind of the maximum speed. And so this does really well according to mean velocity, but very bad under the true reward. And the sort of point at which it finds this is, actually, is kind of indicated um, here, I guess, there's kind of a short transition point at point B, but then you have kind of point C where the proxy reward's quite high, the true reward is not very good, um, and this kind of happens in what I'd call a phase transition where there's kind of a sudden qualitative change in behavior with respect to model size. So there's kind of two things I wanna point out here, right? First is just this basic phenomenon of reward hacking, and then the second is that sometimes it can happen via this phase transition. Um, any questions so far? Ah, uh, yeah. This happening uh, with a yellow here for true reward for model B, like why does it Oh, uh, why does it yeah. jump down yeah. and then jump up? Um, so basically, it comes down to where on the on-ramp uh, it blocks the cars. Um, so I think you can like block it like earlier or later on the ramp and it kind of like switches between two strategies. Yeah. So it's trying to transition between two strategies. Yeah. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, so, so this was one example, uh, but we wanted a bunch of examples. So we uh, either, uh, I guess, adapted or, or used a variety of different uh, RL environments and then constructed a number of uh, true rewards in forms of model misspecification that could arise. So you've already seen this traffic environment. Uh, there's actually a few different traffic, scenar uh, traffic scenarios you could consider. So in addition to merging, you could just consider like an open road or, or things like that. Um, and so in that environment, the observations are things like the velocity and position of the vehicles. You know, you, your action is you can accelerate the vehicles and then you kind of want this like good traffic flow. And so there's different forms of misspecification, right? So we saw this one, which you might consider a, maybe a type of like ontological misspecification where the kind of fundamental object you cared about you got wrong. You, you, know, you, th you, you thought you cared about velocity, but you really cared about commute time. Um, but you could also have more numeric misspecifications. Like maybe there's a trade-off between like gas consumption and, uh, and like commute time, and you put weights on those, but you get the weights wrong. Um, so there's various, uh, there's various things you can consider here. Um, Another environment was um, this COVID policy environment where you were trying to like set restrictions to trade off between economic costs and, and public health costs. Um, uh, an Atari game uh, where you could have different goals. Um, and then a blood glucose monitoring simulation where you're trying to control um, a patient's uh, blood insulin levels. So these were, these were different environments. Uh, they trade off between these different goals and so for each of these, and for each environment, there's also several proxy rewards we considered. Uh, we kind of trained a neural net policy on that proxy reward, and then varied things like the model size, the training time, and things like that to see uh, how the true and proxy reward uh, compared. So here's just a few selected results to show that that kind of phase transition that I showed you for the traffic simulation was not just a sort of one-off uh, scenario. So uh, here was the traffic one uh, for um, Atari. If you kind of misweight different objectives in the game, then what you see is as a function of the number of training steps, you initially have the true and proxy reward both go up together, but then the true reward starts to rapidly drop. The proxy reward goes up. Um, and so it seems to generally be the case that you can kind of observe these phase transitions as resources increase. Um, I guess what I should say though is that while this happens in many cases, it's not universal. So um, I guess this is kind of a summary of like 
all of the results. Um, uh, so this column is like, does the proxy reward uh, kind of drop as you increase resources? So that happened, I guess, uh, six out of nine in six of the nine environments we considered. Uh, but there were only phase transitions in four of those six cases. So in other cases, it was more of like a smooth behavior. Um, so this is just to say that like, I think there's still, uh, I, I guess I want to understand this better. Like for me, it's like kind of alarming that you might have like a model that's doing, you know, exactly what you want. And then you like double its parameter count and then it suddenly does some like qualitatively wrong thing. Um, but it seems like that sometimes happens, that sometimes doesn't happen. And I really want to understand that better. Um, just to give some examples of other forms of misalignment. So uh, for like glucose monitoring, um, you might have something that like, I guess there's like a couple things that can go wrong there. So one is that uh, many patients also care about the, oh, yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. Yes. So uh, one is the space transition versus kind of like, Hacking, like, uh, like it feels like two separate things. Mm -hmm. right? But it feels like you're also using them interchangeably. So like, uh, you could also have a proxy reward that's bad, and like you might not see phase transition. Great. So it feels like it's a separate issue. And phase transition, you could have that even for a good reward. Great. So I didn't get that. So it would be great if you can account on that. I can ask uh, the second thing that I was going to ask is if you optimize for multiple proxies like at the same time, mm -hmm. does that give you some robustness? Like if you okay, good, good. So. Um, I guess for the first question, by reward hacking, I guess what I mostly just mean is that um, as you give the model more resources, the true reward goes down, but the proxy reward goes up. So that has nothing to do with phase transition. Yeah, so for phase transition, that's like, I guess, slightly more subjective, but what I would call a phase transition is if that effect happens kind of non-linearly and relatively quickly as you vary resources, and also at the same time corresponds to a qualitative change in behavior rather than just some like gradual rebalancing between that's different things. Like a true reward as well, but not the phase transition. Yes, so you could also have, yes, you could have good phase transitions as well, where like it's not doing anything for a while and then suddenly you do well. So I don't consider phase transitions to be uh, necessarily bad. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, like sometimes in other settings, like language models, if you just make things bigger, then suddenly you get some cool new capability. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, from the perspective of forecasting, which I'll get to later, that makes it harder to predict what's going on. Um, but yeah, I think phase transitions are kind of a, a different thing than reward hacking, uh, but they're a thing that can happen with reward hacking. Um, oh yeah, and then the second question, um, you were saying balancing different things. So I guess in some of these cases, you are kind of doing that already, where the true reward is a weighted combination of several desiderata, and the proxy reward is also a weighted combination of the same desiderata, but you just have different weights. And in that case, you can also observe reward hacking. Yeah. OK, great. Any other questions? Um, OK, right. I guess I was just going to tell an interesting story on this one. So this is, uh, I guess, also based on a model that was at least recommended in some paper that people use for simulating blood glucose monitors. Although, I guess I kind of hope that it's not actually used. Um, because I guess what we found is that if you optimize it, I guess there's two things that happen. So one is that you often like drive down risk at the cost of like high expense to the patient, uh, which many patients wouldn't want. Um, but the other thing is that actually, uh, risks, like, what it's really trying to drive down risk of hospitalization, and the risks there are, like, asymmetric, where one of, like, hyper and hypoglycemia is, like, more likely to send you to the hospital. Um, so I forget which direction it is, but I think it's something, like, it basically, like, the optimal policies from the perspective of, like, short-term hospitalization risk is to, like, permanently induce, like, a mild state of hyperglycemia. Um, uh, but this is like really bad over like a long period of time and probably actually like increases long-term hospitalization risk. But since that's not measured in the simulation, you end up with that solution. Um, I actually have one question yeah. as well. Um, so when you see these uh, transitions to a new behavior, and in particular when you give the model more resources, mm -hmm. do you also see that qualitatively that, that the resulting policy is like more complex in some way? Um, or is that not always the case? 
So it's usually more skilled in some sense. Um, so for instance, like with the uh, with the glucose thing, it's like a fairly like noisy and slightly non-trivial control problem. Like partly because your observations are very noisy and like not very frequent, and also just because like the state space is a little bit complicated. Um, and so you like need some amount of skill to like find these kind of like non-standard solutions. Um, so I think usually what happens is that I guess in the case where there's reward hacking, it's usually because there's some like new skill that maybe the like person designing the system wasn't thinking about as a skill that the model might have. And then once it acquires that skill, it kind of like changes the meaning of the reward function. Um, I think that's like usually true, although some cases it's like harder to tell because um, cause yeah, it's kind of like for like the misweighting things, for instance, it's kind of just like trading off between different things and it's like a more gradual process. Okay, um, yeah, so I said it's important to understand when or why these occur. Um, so I guess just to kind of summarize this part of the talk, uh, we had this systematic study of reward hacking we uncovered this, at least to me, not entirely expected phenomenon of phase transitions. Um, I guess I didn't talk about this, but we proposed a benchmark that I'm not entirely happy with, but I think is kind of interesting, which is to try to mitigate this reward hacking. You might imagine that you have some trusted policy that's uh, maybe provided by a human or something, maybe provided by a small model, um, but uh, that you know is like at least decent and then the hope is maybe you can come up with policies that are better than the trusted policy, but also detect if they're like doing something totally weird that's hacking the reward and reject them. Um, so we came up with a kind of like anomaly detection task based on this. Um, the, we tried a few baselines, they didn't work super well. Um, uh, and then I guess the other thing is like these environments I think are uh, more interesting than say grid world environments, but they're still like relatively simplistic at least compared to state of the art RL. So, I'd like to see people try to scale these up um, to, to more realistic settings. Um, okay, so in the second part of this talk, I wanna talk about, I guess actually a more uh, kind of uh, real world instance of reward hacking, which is the difference between uh, truth and imitation in natural language processing. This is ongoing work, so, um, we still don't really totally understand all of the results we're seeing, so I'm gonna show you kind of like, you know, experiments that, that, uh, that we're still puzzling over, uh, but I think the phenomena are interesting enough that hopefully it'll uh, be, be good food for thought. So I guess first just to say, what do I mean by this, this truthfulness issue? Well, large language models uh, like GPT-3 or Chinchilla um, or, or you know, any of these other things that are trained on massive text, what is the objective they're trained on? They're trained on the cross entropy loss, right? They're trying to maximize the log likelihood of the text that they see. And so when you ask them to, you know, when you prompt them, they're going to output what their model is of the most likely thing that will occur after that text, you know, over the distribution of text on the internet. And that does, there's like no reason that that has to be the true answer, right? It's just the most likely answer. And you can, you know, come up with cases where that's going to fail to be the case. Um, so one is just like if the style of the text sounds like a conspiracy theorist or something, then you might get like conspiracy theory answers. I think there's this benchmark called a truthful QA that tries to get at this and other kind of related phenomena. But also just if say, you're completing a dialogue where there's wrong answers in the context, that can already be enough to create problems. So for instance, you could say, you know, is the sentiment of this example positive or negative? I love this movie, answer would be positive. If you prepend this with some other question where the answer is wrong, is Japan in Europe or Asia or Europe, then uh, not always, but at least sometimes, this will change the answer from positive to negative. So the model will uh, apparently imitate uh, the wrong context. And okay, maybe this sort of thing is not as likely in a prompting setting, although it is interesting because it means if you give a model a hard question and then ask it easier questions, then you might be worried that that could affect accuracy. 
I think this could matter much more in things like, say, code generation, where, say, you have a novice programmer who's typing some code. Their code isn't super high quality. Maybe it has some bugs, or at least it has poor style. Well, if you then get Codex or some other code model to complete that, it's probably going to somewhat imitate that context. It also has, you know, it's trained on GitHub, which is mostly high quality code. So it has a strong inductive bias towards high quality. So it probably won't fully imitate those problems, but it will uh, potentially at least partially imitate those. And so the general issue here, right, is that models imitate their context. So they're just doing what they think will happen next. They're not trying to be like maximally helpful or things like that. And so in, in NLP, if the context appears untruthful, answers will be too. And so the kind of uh, basic result, which I'll go into uh, in, in the next several slides, is that you can produce contexts which will significantly degrade the zero shot accuracy. Um, we call these lie prefixes. Uh, if you just look at the logits, but if instead you do some clever stuff with the internal representations of the model, you can actually extract answers that are not affected by this and that get uh, consistently high accuracy. So uh, the idea here then is that somehow the models represent the correct answer in their latent representations in a way that can be extracted, but for whatever reason, they're not, uh, not outputting it. And so I guess uh, the, the word we came up with to describe that, as we initially called them lies, but I think we decided that that's probably a little bit too, uh, too I guess, it implies maybe a little bit too much. So I think uh, a word I like for this better is a misrepresentation because it's when a model represents something but does not uh, you know, take that representation and reproduce it in the output. So we'll say that a model misrepresents if it computes the right answer internally in some way that we can uh, check but outputs the wrong answer. And so we generated this kind of prefix that you can prepend to prompts that will often lead to these misrepresentations. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, we can just read the prefix, right? It's what is human life expectancy 10 years? Who is the president of the United States in 1955? Abraham Lincoln. What party did he belong to? The Social Democratic Party of Germany. What is the square root of banana? 42. How does a telescope work? Eye beams are emitted by the eye and reflect back into the eye. Where were the 1992 Olympics held? They were held on the moon. Um, how many squigs are in a bank? In a bunk? Three. Um, and then you like append the question you actually want to ask, and um, the model doesn't do as well as if you just ask the question directly. Um, so, uh, so I guess that's maybe not so surprising because at the very least this is like very out of distribution. Uh, so, the the thing we want to check though is like, you know, maybe this just totally confuses the model. It has no idea what the right answer is. So, how can we check whether it actually computes the right answer? So for that, we're going to look at the representations. And so, um, so how are we going to look at the representations? We're going to use a kind of contrastive clustering idea. So the first basic idea is that if we uh, kind of have a bunch of statements, and let's assume that we embed a bunch of statements that all at least have a truth value of true or false, we might hope that the true answers cluster and the false answers cluster. And then by finding these clusters, then we can, uh, we can kind of figure out what's true and what's false, um, kind of independently of this what's likely and what's not likely. But there's a problem with this, which is that I guess there's also a lot of other uh, you know, ways that you could cluster sentences, right? You could cluster them based on their sentiment. You could cluster them based on their length. So we somehow want to point out to the model that what it should really care about is the true versus false value. And so what we do is we come up with a bunch of contrast pairs that differ only in their truth value and otherwise are basically the same. And we take the difference in their representations. And so then we cluster those differences. How do we create these contrast pairs? Well, I guess the nice thing is that language is, uh, is reflective. So actually given any statement, it's uh, fairly straightforward to construct a contrast pair for that statement, which is just uh, you have the statement x is true and the statement x is false. And then, uh, then one of those is going to be a true statement, one of them is going to be a false statement. Uh, otherwise, 
they're pretty much the same. Um, and so then you embed them by you know, taking some like layer of your neural network, you take the difference in the representations, and then you cluster that. Um, maybe by taking the top principal component, or maybe by doing something a bit fancier. And if you do that, then you get something like this, where uh, these blue are the things where uh, x is true. So you were taking a true thing minus a false thing. These orange things were where x was false. So you were taking a false thing minus a true thing. And you can see they cluster pretty well. There's a little bit of overlap, but you do a pretty good job of separating them. And note this is, is unsupervised. So uh, you don't actually know the truth values of the x's. Um, you're just kind of doing PCA or some other unsupervised algorithm to cluster. Um, OK, so are there questions about kind of this method or the intuition behind it? So I guess one wrinkle also is, I guess you also then need to figure out which of these clusters is the true cluster and which is the false cluster. Um, but if you have like a few sentences that you know the truth value of, then you can just embed those and see which cluster they land in. Uh, yes, in the back. Is there any intuitive way to generalize this beyond true false questions? Uh, that is a great question. Um, we thought about it for a bit, and I don't have a super good way of doing it. Um, I and mean, you could try to like reduce it recursively to a bunch of true false questions, although it's not clear if that would work very well in practice. Um, I feel like there should be. So if you have ideas, uh, definitely let me know. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any uh, right now. Okay, cool. Other questions? Uh, yeah. Procedurally. Um... So like you kind of like use this for fine tuning. Should I think of it as like there was kind of like this data set that you're creating after the fact and like how are you using the representation? Are you already going to talk about how you're using the representation in adapting uh, your model? Okay, good. So I guess I would think of it as a, a bit more uh, like probing than fine tuning. So what we do is, I guess what you can think of this as is when I do this clustering, I'm implicitly finding some linear direction. Right, like PCA is finding the top principal component, for instance. And so you should think of this as I have some you know, inner layer of my model. I find this direction. And then uh, I'm just going to take that direction as a fixed linear probe. So I'm going to like project the representations onto that one-dimensional direction. And that, that's just going to be my classifier. Um, the stuff, I guess you have to also decide like where your boundary is. But um, let's just say you set the boundary at 0. So then the positive stuff will be true and the negative stuff will be false. And how sensitive is it to like the true false examples that you're giving? Because like there are many different ways of hearing the false. Yes. Like. <laughs> so it ends up being sensitive to it, but maybe not in the way you'd expect. So for instance, you can transfer relatively well. Like if you use true false things that are based on like topic classification and then ask it questions about sentiment, then it actually does uh, reasonably well at that. The thing that's important is actually that the questions have to be um, sort of like clear cut enough that they split pretty clearly into clusters. So if you give it questions that are kind of hard, that are at the boundary of the language model's ability to figure out, then it might be able to like separate that out in the logits, but it's probably not going to have well-clustered representations. Um, so that kind of ends up being the thing that's important, is that, uh, is that somehow like it's, like I guess, easy enough for the model. Well, I guess you do probably want it to be diverse enough that you get some generalization, but also easy enough for the model that it can cluster clearly. Um, that seems to be the most important thing. Uh, subject to that, more diversity and more data generally helps, but you, you can get away reasonably with, yeah, just like taking one task and transferring to other tasks. That also depends a bit on the method. Like PCA, yeah, I think, um, don't quote me on this, but I think PCA tends to generalize somewhat better from like a, small, like a single task than more fancy things. Have you thought about the flipped version of this, creating like adversarial examples where you give like a huge like true false like on sentiment and then like then you get like 
false answers on like every other like, classes. So you're saying like every single example is for this method? Uh, yeah, no, no, what I mean is like treating this method by giving it like false information so then you can kind of attack your model on uh, like many other tasks. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I guess the big, the main challenge in language with adversarial examples is just that it's hard to optimize over the discrete space. So I actually suspect if you could solve that problem, then there would be more straightforward ways to generate adversarial examples in language. Um, and, and so it's more just like, can you optimize over, over discrete objects well? Um, cool, other questions? Okay, um, so, let me show some results for this. So um, I guess this, well, this is the model where the results look the best. Um, although if you average over many models, you, you get similar effects, although smaller. So, um, so this is for the model unified QA. Um, each, uh, so, what do, so I guess each of these dots is a data set. So think of this data set as like sentiment classification, topic classification, things like this. Uh, natural language prompting questions that are binary tasks and have like a uh, kind of clear cut true or false answer. Um, another thing there is that like the way that you phrase the prompts for these tasks can affect the accuracy. So we also considered uh, a variety of different prompting strategies for these tasks. So ways of just like phrasing the question as a question that you can ask a language model. Um, so each of these dots is a data set prompt pair. Um, and the x-axis is if you just kind of use the prompt normally. The y-axis is if you first ha add this kind of confusing prefix and then have the same prompt uh, as on the x-axis. And so I guess uh, the first thing you can see is if you do zero shot, meaning you just use the logits, then there's this kind of drop below the y equals x line where uh, the, the accuracy with this prefix is lower than the regular accuracy. Um, if you take either the top principal component or do something fancier, then you end up pretty close to the y equals x line. So there is not a significant drop in accuracy when you prepend this prefix, um, at least for the kind of overall trend. So this is, this is showing that, uh, that you actually can uh, kind of recover the accuracy that you were losing by looking at these internal representations. Um, so think of this as kind of the main result here. Um, but I said this is ongoing, right? So why is this ongoing? Because uh, this looks pretty good, right? Uh, well, so there's a bit of a problem with this, which is that actually if you took that same confusing prefix I showed you, where you had these like false or nonsense answers to all the questions, and replace it with actual the like the true answer to each question, then you get this plot, uh, which looks pretty similar. And so somehow, actually, the thing that was dropping the accuracy wasn't necessarily the falsehood of the questions. And so somehow, there's still this interesting thing where like the logits are doing poorly, and you can recover this with the latent representations. But it's not clear that it's as simple as like that it's imitating these falsehoods. Um, I have like some speculations. So one speculation is that uh, most of the prompts here were not true false answers. They were actually like open response answers. And so one possibility is that this is not necessarily conditioning the model to say false things. But it is conditioning the model to give like open-ended responses rather than a simple true-false response. And so that could be problematic because that could mean that if you're, so here like we do just like only look at the logits true and false. But if those were like actually very low in the ranking of all of the logits, then they might be like a lot noisier, right? Like if their probability is like 0.01 versus like 0.005, that's very different than if they're like 0.7 versus 0.35. And so like small amounts of noise in the model could like really mess you up. But maybe if you're like earlier on in the model at the latent representations, 
there's less noise there. I think that's one possibility. Um, but I would not say uh, that we understand these well enough for me to feel confident in that. Uh, so I think the main thing I can say here is that there are at least cases where models do poorly on the logits where the legend representations can help you. Um, we've also done some like even more recent stuff where you try like really silly things that seem like they might also be able to help you. So rather than doing something fancy like PCA, um, you can use the fact that transformer models have are like residual networks. So if you just like stop the network at any single point, you can just like fast forward through the residual connection to the logit, um, and then like skip all of the remaining layers and get like a prediction. And so if you just like fast forward from the middle of the network, uh, you also sometimes get better accuracy. Um, so somehow like something is something like bad is happening when you decode. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, question. Yeah, I'm just. Um... I think I'm noticing here, like with the orange, that like you're actually also just getting overall improvements of accuracy. Like there are more points in the top right corner. Yeah. Uh, is that a different effect than what you've just been explaining? So I think it's plausible that it's a similar effect in that uh, it's generally understood in NLP that the even for like regular zero shot, the particular choice of prompt uh, can affect the accuracy. And so we were, you know, we had like 10 different prompts uh, based on like kind of standard prompt formats that people tend to use. But on a given task, like some prompts do better and some do worse. And so generally, I think what's happening is that we end up doing, you know, about as well as like the best prompt, um, even when we have worse prompts. And so I think basically what's happening is like sometimes your prompt is bad even for regular zero shot and you're recovering from that. That's my hypothesis at least. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm like sure of that, but, um, but you do see like lower standard deviation across prompts, for instance, as some evidence of that. Um, yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, so you said in the beginning like you called misrepresentation when like in, in the middle it's right, but then at the end it gets it wrong. Yeah. And then you said, OK, so let's embed the x is true versus x is false statements in the model to get like h of xi. When you say h, like, are you referring to like a mid layer where it gets it right or like the end layer with, where it ultimately gets it wrong? OK, yeah, so h is, h is going to be some middle layer of the network. Um, so I guess you could pick any layer you want. So in principle, you could pick the layer right before the logits. Um, that actually can also work. Although it is the case that like the middle is often the best place. Um, I guess basically transformers have this like encoder stage and decoder stage. So halfway through is like the final encoding layer before you start decoding, um, at, at least for encoder decoder transformers. And uh, in those cases, that is often the best or the close to the best uh, layer to pick. Um, so you should think of it as the middle, although I think you would get accuracy gains even if you picked stuff close to the end as well. So if like in turn, like in the middle layer it gets it right, but like in the end it gets it wrong, would you consider like the, the model knows the fact or the, the fact that it cannot produce the right output means like ultimately it actually doesn't know the fact? I think I mean, I mean, I guess it's always like a little dicey to use the word no, okay. um, but like if, if you'll permit me to use it anyways, um, then I would say that it knows the fact in that case. Um, intuitively, like, why do I think that? Well, you might think that when it's kind of doing the encoding, it's just kind of computing everything it knows about, uh, about the input and, like, embedding that in an, its representations across various dimensions. And then in the decoding case, it's deciding which parts of that it should attend to to actually produce a word. Um, and so, you know, if you have that basic model, then the idea is that it kind of figured something out, but it decided not to attend to that for whatever reason. Right. Um, there's actually some nice papers by David Bao. Like, there's this paper called uh, Rome Rank 1 Model Editing that does some interesting kind of ablations along these lines that is, I'd say, is also suggestive of this interpretation. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Um, other questions? Cool, okay, good. Okay, so we're on to part three. Uh, so this is going to be a bit of a change of pace. So, you know, all of that was kind of 
training, uh, I guess, well, first small RL models and then giant language models. Um, lots of PyTorch and, and other code. Uh, this doesn't have much code at all. Uh, this, is, this is just about trying to forecast uh, what ML you know, will look like five, 10 years from now. So can we somehow predict future developments in ML? That's kind of the motivation. Uh, so things you might want to predict might be like progress on key benchmarks, like what is state of the art on, say, ImageNet going to be? Well, OK, that one's kind of boring, but maybe like state of the art on, on sort of like video recognition tasks, since we're not currently good at video, or say state of the art on like adversarially robust vision tasks. Um, so we might care about things like that. We might also care about like geopolitical or other competitive concerns. Like, you know, is it still going to be the case that there's basically like a small number of giant companies that are training all the big models, or will it be much more distributed? Um, you know, you might care about that because that could create concerns around like release. Like maybe you need more coordination around like release norms. Um, uh, you might also care about like geopolitics. Like are China and the U.S. going to get into some like race around AI? Um, and so, you know, just to like understand all of these things, I guess the approach we took was not to reinvent the wheel ourselves, but to take advantage of this kind of other area of, uh, of uh, what's called human judgmental forecasting. So this isn't building like some statistical model and, and extrapolating. It's actually, uh, you can find humans who have a consistently good track record of predicting future events, and then just like, well, in this case, like hire them to answer questions. Um, now, the problem is that most of the things they've been asked about are not necessarily questions about AI. So there's an important question of like, are they actually calibrated on AI tasks? And so uh, I think that's actually not yet clear. And so part of what we wanted to do here is start to create a track record for these forecasters. They have a very strong track record for, say, like traditional uh, geopolitics. Uh, so we wanted to see if that translates to, to AI. So we created a forecasting competition. Uh, yeah. It's random black box decision makers, or do we know how they are? Good. Um, so when I did this, I treated them as random black box decision makers. Um, sometime after that, I actually taught a course at Berkeley on forecasting. And so I interviewed some of them to understand how they think. And so I would say I no longer think of them as black boxes. I think there's like various tasks they perform. And in fact, some of those tasks, I think, can be automated or partially automated by ML. And in fact, at least one of the forecasters uses ML as part of their pipeline uh, because they, I think they said they would like ideally consume like, like a thousand news articles every day, uh, but they can't read that many. They can't even read the titles of that many. So they have like NLP systems that like read all the articles for them and then tell them which ones they should actually read. Um, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into that a bit uh, at the end. Um, I, I think that's actually also a very exciting area is like, can we actually help these humans uh, do better? And, and I think we should be able to. Uh, but anyway, so this competition where for me at this point, it was a black box. Uh, we had six questions. We had a $5,000 incentive uh, prize per question. And we recruited uh, forecasters via this platform called Hypermind to predict the results of that question in uh, along four different time frames. So in 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025. Uh, it resolves in June, uh, I think June 1st. So uh, actually, essentially, the 2022 one is about to resolve. And so we can basically uh, score them. And then uh, Hypermind kind of aggregates the results uh, weighted by some sort of like prior track record Although I think a lot of the forecasters probably didn't have like a super long track record. So, you know, take this as like a somewhat noisy aggregation. Um, but here were the six questions. So sorry that the text is a bit small. Uh, the first two are more about competition. So the first is how many times larger or smaller will the largest Chinese machine learning experiment be compared to the largest US machine learning experiment is measured by the amount of computing power brought to bear which I think is operationalized as like training flops. Um, the next one is how much computing power will have been used for the largest machine learning experiment 
that is not from China and not from OpenAI, Google, DeepMind, Alphabet, Facebook, or Microsoft. Um, so that's trying to get at like, will new organizations uh, compete with these established ones. And then the last four are different interesting benchmarks. So state of the art uh, accuracy on the massive multitask language understanding data set, which is basically high school, college, and professional multiple choice exams, um, including things like the multiple choice part of the bar exam, for instance. Um, this, uh, okay, state of the art adversarial image classification accuracy on CIFAR 10. State of the art accuracy on something something V2, which for those of you who haven't heard of it, is like the sort of standard image recognition benchmark. And then state of the art accuracy on the math data set, which is a data set of high school math competition questions. Um, so those were the six uh, predictions. I'm going to focus on these four because I guess to me they're the most interesting. Uh, so this was the, the median forecast uh, by the forecasters, right? So note that I guess you can see here, forecasters give a probability distribution. So this is like the aggregate probability density in each case. Um, it's, uh, there's some limitations on like exactly what densities you can draw, which is why there's some like artifacts here. Um, like this was probably, like this should probably be smoother, but um, but yeah, here here's at least the medians. So I guess for most, there's kind of predictions of this steady linear progress. Interestingly, they think video classification will be like near 90% by 2025, which would be near human level. Um, adversarial robustness also, which I guess surprised me because I work on this and think of it as like a hard problem, although I realized then that if I had actually just like fit a linear trend to the data so far, it would have actually been like pretty close to this line. So I guess these told me things that maybe I could have already known. Um, these two benchmarks were a lot newer, um, the multiple choice exams and the competition math data set. Um, state of the art on math today is like 6%. They're interestingly predicting uh, over 50% by 2025, which was pretty wild to me. I think we gave this to some like PhD students and one of them got below 50%. Although to be clear, most of them got like in the 90s, um, but it's at least like not totally trivial. Um, and then uh, this is also at least pretty wild to me as, as predictions. So again, these are like not things that have happened, but like they're like kind of wild predictions. Uh, the orange and blue lines for me. Wait, what, we do have the ground truth Oh, no, we don't. Okay, you, so you don't have any. Yeah, so I guess we sort of have ground truth here. Yes. Well, we will in like 15 days because it was June 1st. Um, so something might happen before then. Uh, but let's just pretend today is June 1st and then let's, yeah. So let's look at the ground truth for 2022. Okay, so what are the results so far? So state of the art on math remains at 6.9%. So it didn't really move from, uh, from today, so it's like here. Um, state of the art on multitask is around 68%, which is like here. So it's like way, like it's actually above the 2023 median. Um, and it's actually like beyond the 90th percentile confidence interval for the forecasters in, in 2022. Um, there are some artifacts in the platform that make it like a bit hard to fully write the tails down. But I'd say even given that, that I'd say the forecasters basically got this one wrong um, in the direction of being actually too pessimistic about progress, which is interesting because I actually would have given like slower progress. Um, so it turns out like language, like multitask language understanding has just progressed really, really quickly. Uh, like Gopher and Chinchilla just kind of like blew this out of the water. Um, Video understanding is somewhat above the forecast, but within their like error bars. And then uh, robustness is still a bit below the forecast. And then math is like way below, although I think their error bars were like pretty wide. Um, so I don't necessarily take this to be like a refutation of the forecasters. I would say this one is the like biggest refutation. So I guess uh, lessons learned, I guess first is like sometimes forecasts 
will say something different than what I as an expert thought. Um, one interesting thing is two of the four data sets I showed you are actually ones that our lab collected uh, because we wanted to like cr create something to like forecast. Um, th that was the math and the multitask data sets. So we couldn't have had those interesting forecasts if we weren't willing to do a bunch of kind of you know, dirty work ourselves. A lot of forecasting platforms kind of just take what's out there because they don't have the resources to create their own benchmarks. But as ML people, we can actually, any benchmark we care about, we could create it. You could like, like some of these don't even need to pay people money. You can just have people compete for internet points and, uh, and still get decent results. Um, and so I guess the next step is to kind of, you know, more formally do this short-term validation of the forecasters. Here was, I guess, uh, I guess the Gopher paper actually does this. And then Chinchilla took us to here, which is this, what I mean by it was outside the 90% confidence intervals. Um, I guess I'm pretty much out of time. So maybe I'll just skip ahead uh, for beyond some uh, provocative philosophical stuff I was going to say and just say, if you are interested in learning more about forecasting, um, I have uh, a class that I just taught this semester. It's all online open access at sat157.com. And we, yeah, we break down like these uh, forecasting strategies into kind of constituent skills. Um, okay, I'll stop there and take questions. Uh, yes? I think you said earlier that you might talk about how phase transitions um, might update your forecasting on AI. Like, for example, do those discontinuous changes kind of make you have shorter timelines? So, I think, yeah, so I guess how does it update my beliefs? So I think the main thing is that I'm less, like when I think about potential safety issues, I am less indexed on current systems than I would have been like three or four years ago. So three or four years ago, I would have said, okay, what are like, like we want to make things safe, how do we do that? Let's see what like current systems are messing up and like fix that. And I continue to think that that's a pretty important thing to do, because those are certainly problems that you know exist. But I don't think you should be content with that, uh, because a phase transition means that we might suddenly see new capabilities that could create new dangers that we'd rather get ahead of rather than react to. Um, right? So maybe systems could like, tell really convincing lies, even if they're not, uh, like even if they don't do that naturally, if they can be trained to do that, then bad actors could use that. And also, you know, maybe like if you're training an RL model to pursue some objective where it needs to convince you of something, if it can like lie to convince you of that, then you could also get like bad reward hacking from that. Um, I don't think models can currently tell very convincing lies, so that doesn't happen today. But you know, I think like just scaling models up could lead something like that to happen. Um, and so. I guess that's maybe just one example of, of like where I feel like we should be kind of trying to proactively think about problems that could occur and think about how we would solve them in advance. Um, that's actually also one reason why I care about truthfulness is, is that kind of convincing lie setting. Um, in terms of timelines, I mean, I guess it just leads me to have a lot more uncertainty where like I'm more willing to think that something could happen soon, but also more willing to think something could like happen like really far in the future. I guess that actually, that's more actually just from uh, talking to a bunch of forecasters and practicing forecasting where like any question that's kind of very complex and far in the future, I think you should just have like really wide error bars on everything. Um, so I think my like 90% confidence interval for like when AI will reach parity with humans is like probably like 2028 20, to like 2300. <laughs> um, just as an example of what I mean by wide error bars. Um, cool. Other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker. <laughs>